from uh, the, the, pardon me, I'm just uh, pulling up the, um, pulling up his details. So I've had the great honor of working with Dr. Jacob Udo, Udo Jacob before. Um, he has worked at the American University of Nigeria since 2013 as faculty, program chair and dean. And he conducts very interesting research that's located at the intersection between communications, conflicts and peace building with a particular reference to Nigeria, to Somalia and to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In 2016, he led a really interesting project that GCPEA was personally interested in on, um, on e, uh, instructive, alternative instruction, so radio instruction for students that were out of school as a result of insecurity. Um, he has also produced a documentary, which is an oral history exposition of the Boko Haram insurgency in Machika and the post-conflict peacebuilding efforts that followed. And he leads research on a broad range of topics such as mobile phone blackouts, counterinsurgency operations. And last year he published a book called Convincing Rebel Fighters to Disarm, um, focusing on the use of UN information operations in the DRC. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Dr. Jacob. Thank you so much for being here with us. Outstanding, if that's okay. Thank you so much for making the time to come out this um, morning or sort of rainy afternoon. Nigeria is located at Africa's religious fault lines with Islam advancing from the north of the continent and Christianity from, from the south. The country is evenly divided between Christians and Muslims with Muslims predominantly to the north of the country and Christians to the south. Over the years since independence from British colonial rule in 1960, Nigeria has had its great moments as well as its difficult times. Within a relatively short period of time, it has grown its economy, overtaking South Africa to become Africa's largest economy. The number of universities has grown from less than 50, barely two decades ago, to 161 universities, comprising of 40 federal universities, 47 state universities, and 74 private universities. This is in addition to several polytechnics and three-year colleges. Yes, there have been remarkable advancements in Nigeria's education sector, but these have been blighted by the Boko Haram insurgency religionized politics and corruption. The relationship between Boko Haram, which loosely translates to Western education is forbidden, and education in Nigeria is quite convoluted, far more than what its rather sinister name suggests. Although Boko Haram is overtly opposed to all forms of Western civilization, not only education, but democracy, rule of law, women empowerment, and so on, it has long been known that many of its members are university students and graduates. Some have science and engineering backgrounds. Boko Haram has consistently attacked education institutions in northern Nigeria, a region that is already stressed. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, between 2009, when the insurgency started, and 2017, over 50,000 deaths have been recorded in the country because of the directly as a result of the insurgency. The University of Medugri, located at the epicenter of the Boko Haram insurgency, has suffered a string of suicide attacks by Boko Haram since January 2017, resulting in at least 14 deaths and 33 injuries, according to the Free to Think report of the Scholars at Risk Network. Most of the suicide bombers that have attacked Unimate are young girls. Indeed, according to UNICEF, between 2014 and 2017, Boko Haram has deployed no less than 117 child suicide bombers. 80% of them have been girls as young as eight years old. Everyone in this room, I am sure, is familiar with the sad story of government girls' secondary school in Chibok. 
The lives of two 76 schoolgirls changed on the night of April 14, 2014, when a truck of Boko Haram fighters raped into the premises of the school. About half of these girls regained their freedom. Many of them are pursuing bridge programs, both at the American University of Nigeria and at Dickinson College, where I am currently a visiting scholar. And every time I see these young girls at Dickinson, I'm reminded of the important work that we do. Although Boko Haram currently constitutes the biggest threat to education in Nigeria, it is by no means the only threat. The increasing religionization of politics in Nigeria is gradually slipping through the doors of our higher education institutions. Only a few months ago, the Modibo Adama University of Technology in Adamawa State in northeast Nigeria was shut down after clashes between Muslim and Christian students led to the death of one student and the burning down of churches and mosques. The crisis arose from student union elections which pitted Christian students against Muslim students. At the core of a growing menace in the education sector in Nigeria is a hyper-religionized politics and identities in the country. This started barely six months, I should say, after Nigeria's return to civilian rule in 1999 after decades of military dictatorships. In January 2000, the government of Zamfara State instituted Sharia law, and since then, 11 states out of Nigeria's 36 states have also instituted Sharia law. The implementation of Sharia law follows an increasingly dominant religious identity over other forms of self-identity in Nigeria. It is impossible to adequately discuss the future of higher education and democracy in Nigeria without tackling issues of religion and politics, and how these are sipping their way into higher education. Student union politics, which can be as frenetic as mainland politics, adopts the same religious and ethnic rhetorics and appeals used in mainland politics. Faculty politics, including promotion and appointments, are increasingly more connected with religious identities than they are with competence and objectivity. The sad consequence is that the education system in Nigeria is becoming increasingly divided and broken. Add a culture of corruption in the country, which has translated into endless sleaze of sex and cash for great scandals, then you see why the future of higher education in Nigeria is anything but cheerful. Various universities have done a lot to protect themselves, but mainly from, only from physical attacks. The University of Medugri, for example, has dug trenches around its campus. I'll show you a video. This extraordinary barrier is being built over the summer and it's designed to foil suicide bombers. When it's finished, it will run completely around the university to offer protection. Now, the suicide bombers normally cross these fields. This is on the outskirts of the city. And interestingly, at the height of the insurgency, the university was left untouched. But that all changed this year. And dangerous times call for urgent measures. And that's why the authorities have dug this trench two meters high and it's all designed to stop suicide bombers getting into the university and killing students and professors. The fact, however, is that trenches, no matter how deep they are dug, will not protect and insulate universities and scholars from the social and political stress of the mainland, of the town, if I should say. Where I'm from, we have a saying, the nose should not feel too secure when the eyes are suffering. It will be remiss of me if I do not use this forum to make a case for a new relationship between primarily African universities, I should say, and their communities. In Nigeria in particular, with its many challenges, we see the need for new conversations on the evolving role of universities in our rapidly changing society. The question really is, should universities be ivory towers digging trenches to protect themselves from their communities, while at the same time inhaling the same toxic political stench that tears and divides the country? Or can universities articulate a new role set for themselves as engaged members of their own communities, serving the common good? 
Should economics leave because they can? Or should they stay back and find solutions that can serve the common good? A communitarian approach to higher education, particularly in developing societies, requires universities and scholars to use their resources and expertise to help meet the social needs of their communities and model the society that they hope to see. The American University of Nigeria, where I've worked as I was introduced since um, 2013, has an interesting mandate as a development university. Civic engagement and community development programs are a key part of academic and social life on campus, and research is built around these. Students work with faculty to bring social problems to the classrooms and find solutions to them. I've worked with students in my courses, for example, to investigate the nature and the manifestations of extremism, and, and have also mobilized women to challenge Boko Haram's use of suicide bombers or young female suicide bombers. I have a video here that I'll play for you to see. This um, campaign was actually developed and led by students. A girl like me. A girl like me. Like me. A girl like me. A girl like me. A girl like me. Like me. The campaign reached over 6 million people and um, was recognized by Facebook and also featured by Facebook on their counter speech website. In addition to that, we have organized um, peace through sports tournaments um, to actually bring um, at-risk youth together, um, particularly um, Christians and Muslim youth to bring them together so that they can find new ways of living together. In addition, at the height of the Boko Haram insurgency, the university fed almost 300,000 displaced persons for over a year. We have also been at the forefront of conducting oral histories of Boko Haram survivors to maintain memories and stories of the insurgency for a possible future truth and reconciliation commission, or even trials at the International Criminal Court, or maybe a special tribunal. In conclusion, I wish to say that universities and scholars can indeed be agents of social change in their own communities. Organizations such as the Scholars at Risk should, I believe, find new ways to expand their support to scholars that choose to remain in their home countries. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, very interesting and thought-provoking uh, words and also for sharing those, um, the videos with us. Um, it's rather shocking to see uh, how the, the academic landscape becomes like a landscape of security um, in, in an effort to try and preserve the, the safety and security of students. But then I think, you know, there are questions to be asked about how then that affects the open and, open and free exchange that universities are hoped to, to provide with the community. So it's, it's a really difficult uh, tension to, to overcome in, in situations like the one faced by the University of Majiguri. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jacob. Um, but we will move, of course, to our next speaker. Um, and uh, Professor Warfa is also someone uh, that the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack has previously worked with. Um, he is the Vice Chancellor of Garissa University in Kenya, um, which unfortunately is, is a university that we all know the name of. Um, 
because of the horrific attack that occurred there on the 2nd of April in 2015. Um, and Professor Warfa was presiding over the university when that terrible attack took place, resulting in the, the deaths of at least 148 people and the injuring of 79 more. Um, following the attack, Professor Warfa has overseen the implementation of a number of measures aimed at improving the protection and security of the university's students and their staff. Um, he, is also, he also has over 30 years of experience in lecturing and university management, including a PhD in curriculum and instruction. Um, in 2015, he traveled to Istanbul to participate in a workshop that we organized and to share his very rich experience with us. And now he will do the same with all of you. So thank you very much for being here, Professor Warfa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my story is very unique and it pains me to this day because of what happened that day. It was the 2nd of April around 5.40. I was just seated like on a chair like this, the lights went off and I called the electrician because we live on the compound, university compound with the students, all lecturers and my deputies at that time. The lights went off and then I called the electrician and asked him what's happening. And he said, well, it's only one section line is working. The other line is not working. So I told him, is the cafeteria lights on? Are they cooking breakfast? He said, yes. Then I waited for a few minutes. Then I had the first bullet from the gate. So I called. We had four security men. And I assumed that two were in tuition side. The other two were in the boarding section. So I assumed if these four are able to, at least to shoot, they were able to stop the terrorist, and then probably they'll come to my house. My house was at the gate, and I was alone there. But to my surprise, two left earlier. They were not there, two of the police officers, the only two. So I called one of them, and I said, are you hearing the bullets? And he said, yes. I told him it's from the gate. He said, no, it's from the field. I said, no. I'm in the house, but I can hear it's the gate. Can you get ready? It was the last time I had it. So the bullets went on and on, so from the gate, they killed two officers there, and then they went running all the way to the, one of the classrooms. We are going to have exams, it's almost Eastern time, and students were in class revising. So they killed the first students, 12 of them in the classrooms. And they did not stop, they went all the way to, we, have, we had four hostels, and luckily the, the, the two officers were able to shoot at one of them at where the hostels were. And then they were deflected, so they went to the big hostel where there were about 500 students. That's where they took the student hostage. And of course, it was from 5.40, by 7.30, that's when the police came. And I had a lot of bullets, so I could not leave the house because I was told not to leave. We were all held up in the houses. Until 11 o'clock, that time we were able to come out. And of course, I, I realized that we have lost 12 students that time. And then we waited and waited. By the time the special forces came from Nairobi, Nairobi is about 500 kilometers from Garissa, where we were. And of course, the road is not like E94, e the one from Minneapolis to Chicago, which I know very well. So the roads are not that good. So they arrived at about 3.30. So we were called to the police station and we were told now, can you give them the map of the hostel? So we did that and they went in at 4.15. By the time they went in, there were no students to save. They were all dead. They killed 143 students there. Plus the 12 who were killed outside, the 100, almost 148 students were killed in the dome. It was a very pathetic day for us. And of course I say the stain in our history. Of course, it took us almost a week burying the dead, collecting bodies. It, is, it was very painful. And to this day, we still have that sky in our, our hearts. So what did you do, do different after that? Well, what we did was we, we, we had to build a perimeter wall. We closed the university for a whole year, 2015. It was closed to the April, so the whole year it was closed. Then 2016, we built a perimeter wall and then put up reservoir wire about eight meters high. And then we have a gate 
which is monitored 24 hours by police officers. Then we have biometric at the gate also where the students identify their fingerprints. And then inside we also have other police officers. Then we, we do have also a watchtower, we have CCTV cameras, and now we have to do everything differently. And of course today we have, that time we had 750 students, today we have almost a thousand students, but it took us a long time to convince students to come back to the university. So we're trying our best to make sure that students are safe, not only students, even the staff. Even for us, our own security is in, is in danger. Because now the situation is different, they're saying, okay, we'd go for the staff this time. The first time it was the students, but it's the staff because they are the ones who are keeping them here. They've come back, so we're really doing a lot of work to make sure that we keep the students safe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Werfa, for that really searing testimony of your experience um, and the experience of your university staff and students on that day. Um, I'm sure that everybody in the room is, is really moved by what you've told us just now, and it really brings to the forefront the, the, the reality of what we talk about when, I mean, at the most extreme example of when we talk about attacks on higher education. Um, and thank you also for sharing uh, some of the, the measures that you have undertaken in the university in order to improve the safety and the security of your students and your staff. Um, and many of those have been instructive for um, the work that we do on, on the Safe Schools Declaration when we try to encourage um, governments in situations of insecurity and conflict to improve the protection of their um, educational infrastructure. Um, and I hope that your students will continue to, to return and uh, that the university will continue to grow and, and to flourish. And thank you again for your work. Um, so we have heard about these types of uh, mass premeditated attacks that have happened, carried out by Boko Haram in Nigeria, carried out by Al-Shabaab in, in Kenya. Um, and as I said, these represent probably the, the most extreme version of, of an attack on, on higher education. But there are, of course, other challenges that we've been discussing over the, the last number of days and in, in a variety of contexts. So I'd like, before opening the floor to questions, I would like to ask uh, both of you if there are some of these other challenges that, uh, that higher education is facing in your country contexts around maybe harassment, restrictions of freedom of academic, or restrictions of academic freedom, um, threats and, and, and such that are limiting your ability to do your work and your students' ability to learn and to, to grow. So, okay. Professor Work. Uh, right now, professors have been all on strike for the last, I think, four months. University semesters have been interrupted because they're asking for higher pay. And of course, the government is not talking to them. The students are on campus, idle, parents complaining, saying that why are students not being taught? January, February, March, April, we were supposed to have had our semester finishing in end of April and closing for, for the semester until <coughs> September. But students have not been taught, no exams. The government has talked to the union. That situation going on right now in Kenya, and they are saying they are going to bring new changes so in future, there are not going to be no, no more unions. The government will be controlling universities just like they control high schools. So we're just waiting for that to go to, bill to go to parliament and they pass it. That's the situation in Kenya right now. So we're just waiting for what's going to happen. But it looks like so many scholars might leave Kenya probably in the next uh, six or seven months, depending on what happens. No, it's, it's interesting, the situation is not much different in, in Nigeria. The, the difference really is that um, over the years, the federal government-owned and state government-owned universities um, have really suffered in terms of funding. They're not having as much funding as they should from the federal government. And the outcome really is 
that um, the, the stability of those um, federal universities have been called to, to question. Now, over the past few years, uh, there have been a rising number of private universities. So most of the professors in federal universities, um, the very good professors in federal universities, have moved to private universities that pay a lot more, and they have um, fatter wallets. Um, the problem there is that the private universities are very, very expensive. They are priced way out of the reach of most Nigerians. Um, the, the, the fees at private universities are in, in most cases like a thousand percent even higher than the, um, than the state universities. So, um, so the students that cannot afford to go to private universities um, just have to, to wait for, um, for, for, for the little that they can have from the federal universities. And at the moment, it's not really that much. Very challenging environments that both of you are, are um, speaking about. Um, and of course, there are, I guess, when you talk about the, the root causes, um, those are very deep issues uh, around conflict and division within communities. And, and Dr. Jacob, you talked a little bit about the, the peace building work that you've been involved in and others. Um, so it seems to me that there has to be a sort of a multi-pronged approach to addressing these issues where you try to uh, address the root causes of conflict, bring communities back together, but then at the same time you take these very practical protective measures in order to, in the short term at least, uh, make the spaces safer. Um, what kind of steps do university leaders take to address these issues? And also do you have um, some insight as well into some positive steps perhaps that the, the governments might be taking in order to address these challenges? Okay, um, well, for um, the, the way I tend to, to look at it really is that universities can really be agents of social change and scholars as well, not just social change, but political change as well. Um, and for us at the American University of Nigeria, we we um, were located in northeast Nigeria, almost at the center of the Boko Haram insurgency. At the height of the insurgency, we were under intense pressure to shut down. Um, but the president at that time of the university, um, Dr. Maggie Ensign, felt that if the university should shut down at that time, that we would betray the, the local community because Yola was almost the only city that was left untouched by the insurgents. So Yola had some almost 400,000 internally displaced persons there overflowing from other cities into, into the town. And if the university had shut down, the banks would have shut down, businesses would have shut down as well. So there would have been that domino effect on the society. Um, we were under intense pressure, as you can imagine, from parents, from faculty, from students to shut down. But somehow the university held its nerves and, and kept its doors open and supported the community. Um, but what we did somehow provided a protection for us because um, you can't really think of Yola right now without um, the American University of Nigeria being seen as a neighbor in the sense of being an engaged member of the community. So, but different universities would really have to find their own ways to, to be engaged with their own communities, um, to, to open their doors. Because that could be a form of protection, particularly in, in, in violently um, stressed societies. Uh, just like you said, Dr. Jacob, we do have funding problems too. In our case, we neighbor Somalia and Ethiopia. The border is porous, the small arms coming into the country, and ethically we are Somalis on the border. This is the first university we have had 50 plus years after independence. 
the first university ever. That area is about the size of France, geographically. That size is big. So only the first university, the only university. And now, because of the attack, the politicians came together and said, we must defend this university. We must build it. We must look for funding. So what they are trying to do right now is to make sure that they build this university to the best of their abilities so that it can be one of the best universities in that region. Because the only university we have for that community who lives in that area. Thank you very much, Professor Warfa. I would like to open the floor out to questions. Are, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please, Katja. Thank you for your help. Yeah, good morning and very nice presentation. I happen to be Dr. Jacob's neighbor. I'm from Cameroon and I feel the impact as well. After returning home from, uh, after my PhD and some postdoc, I returned back home and I'm working at the education sector. And, and we have recently an displaced people from Cameroon into Nigeria, the Western Cameroon part we so called, they are completely dis displaced. And our area also is completely displaced. So the last two years don't have effective education. My question is, what we've been thinking, have you thought about e-learning in this area where we can really like boost the servers maybe out of Africa where the content cannot be deleted and have some apps for students to follow their courses? I think, thanks, thanks for asking that question. Yeah, um, it's, it's a project that we've, um, we've done. Sorry, I didn't mention that obviously because of time. But um, a couple of years ago, had um, funding, um, that, that was from USAID, um, about just over $800,000. It was at the height of the, in, the insurgency as well, and um, there were hundreds of thousands of, um, of refugees. This particular project was targeted really at children, displaced children, because um, there were tens of thousands of children that came into Yola, and there were just no schools for them. So what we did really was to create radio programs, um, develop um, literacy, numeracy um, content on mobile apps, and we reached 22,000 um, displaced children in Yola for that program. But you know, the problem with programs is that they have a limited lifespan and limited funding. Um, so that program where the funding came to an end even before the insurgency came to an end. So, and um, the, the government was not in the financial position to, um, to continue supporting that program. But the good thing about it is that what was developed, the modules that were developed on the apps and the radio programs that were distributed to local stations, local radio stations, and the workbooks that followed the radio programs were also distributed to local communities so that they can actually continue using them on their own. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a good, a good model. Um, and um, n not just in this case, but in areas of limited statehood generally, there is need to, to find um, um, ways of um, getting education to continue um, in societies that um, where schools have been shut down because of insurgency or because of some disaster or the other. Thank you very much. Um, and certainly these uh, creative uh, alternative methods of delivery are really crucial and it's, it's great that we um, are able to learn from your experience of that project and, and hopefully others in challenging contexts can maybe adapt some of those methods. Are there any other questions from the floor at this point? Um, two at the back, so maybe we'll take both of them. Thank you, Katja. Thank you, my name is Jean-Pierre. I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, I kept, sorry, I came a bit late, but um, I want to know about uh, the national strategy in Nigeria uh, to protect universities because the Boko Haram ideology itself is a threat to universities and education. I don't know if you talked about it, the meaning of Boko Haram itself. So just, it's 
really uh, an ideology which is mixed of course but the main line is to attack universities and education so what's national strategy in nigeria to to protect these institutions and schools thank you if we take the other question as well and then we can respond thank you Professor Awafa, thank you for your presentation and for um, giving us an account of what happened at uh, Garissa. Um, some information received indicates that there was intelligence that the attack was imminent. Can you shed light on this if that was the case and if so, to what extent the government was culpable in not putting structures in place to avoid such a, a disaster? Thank you. Thanks, Jean-Pierre, for, for your question. Um, in th the short answer is this, th there's none. There is no strategy by the federal government to protect higher education institutions. Um, yes, um, the country is a signatory to the Safe Schools um, Declaration, but um, in terms of higher education, there's really nothing much. The universities uh, really have to be the ones they're really the ones that find ways to protect themselves, like in the case of um, uh, Unimate, for example, University of Medugri, digging trenches around, um, around the, the university. Um, th there is really no, um, no clear strategy in that sense. Um, Boko Haram is not the only stressor, really. There are various other stressors. Boko Haram is only one of several others, the Fulani herdsmen, for example, um, kidnappers, for example, um, folks being kidnapped. A couple of professors I know in, in, in the Niger Delta region in Patakot have been kidnapped for ransom. So th there are various other stresses um, that are there. Boko Haram is obviously the most widely known, obviously because of its um, the, the nature of of the insurgency and its clear um, ideology of, um, of challenging Western, uh, just Western education, but Western civilization. The, the, the Boko actually is, um, is actually Western civilization, not just Western education in that sense. So th there's really no strategy, unfortunately. I wish, I wish uh, there was one that I can clearly articulate, but there's really none. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I joined the university on, from all universities, the, the, the parent university in October 2014. And I remember talking to the students, a hall like this, and faculty members. And I look at the students, I told them that Al Shabaab will come here one day, but I don't know when. Because most of them were from outside Garissa. But the students didn't take me seriously. Everyone was laughing that time. But I knew there was going to be a problem. So I went to see the security, county security committee. And I told them that we need more police officers for Garissa University. And they said, well, we don't have enough staff. We'll give you only four. Those are the four that we were given at the time. So I started writing letters to the county security committee, all the way to Nairobi, those who are concerned with security. The power secretary, Ministry of Education, internal security. And I kept on writing until 16th March. That was the last time I wrote to them. And we were attacked on 2nd April. Kept on telling them that we're going to have a problem here. Can you please give us more security officers? And then, before they attacked their intelligence report, which they did not share with us, but after the attack, 10 days of the attack, and I went to Nairobi, burying the dead, I got information from somebody that they knew were going to be attacked. They had information that we were going to attack Garrett University was a target, medical training school was also a target, and technical college also was a target. Those three were targets but nothing was done about it. 
But it's true that they, they had intelligence. But we, we didn't get enough security. That's what pains me more. But nobody wants to talk about it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that, that I have the opportunity to, to speak with both of you today and that you've been here to share um, your experiences with everyone. Um, and actually, uh, Dr. Jacob mentioned uh, Nigeria and the Safe Schools Declaration. And as it happens, I'll be traveling hopefully to Nigeria next week to meet with the, the Ministry of Education um, to talk to them about their implementation of the, the declaration. And um, I'm really pleased that you've mentioned this and, and I will go and, and make sure that I do some strong advocacy for a focus on higher education um, when they do, when I meet with them. Um, because when, when we say safe schools declaration, we mean all levels of education from kindergarten to university. So uh, I'll be sure to, to raise that with them. Are there any further questions from the floor at this point? Oh, a lot actually. <laughs> so let's take. Thank you. Uh, Anas Al Khabur, Gothenburg University. Uh, my question is to Dr. Jacob, and it's related more to cultural heritage. I don't know if you have information, and it's a um, very sensitive question also. Um, it's about uh, Benin, bronze, and, and the human remains that arrived in uh, different uh, international museums at the end of the 19th century. And uh, now there are uh, demands for uh, restitution and repatriation. And we, we don't know who, who owns uh, heritage in this case. Is this the, the, the dynasty of uh, Oba, the King Oba, or is the government? And what's the role of academia in this case? Could you be involved in this dialogue? It will be easier in any case, if you have information about this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a very interesting um, question. I mean, uh, yeah, the Benin bronze and various other artifacts, not just from, from Nigeria, but other countries in, in Africa. Um, I do agree with you that um, academics can can maybe contribute to, to the return of, of some of these artifacts. Um, the issues of reparation is, is, is another issue completely, but at least the, the return of, of these artifacts. Um, but again, I think it's, um, it's something that definitely academics should, should think more about, um, getting themselves involved in in the campaigns, because this has been left to government and it's been seen more as, as a cultural campaign, governmental political campaign, but I think within the, the academe, it would add a lot, a lot more teeth, I believe, to it, yeah. So I agree with you for that, yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Astral I'm from Ethiopia originally, and uh, my question is also to Dr. Jacob. Uh, in your presentation, you said that one of the threats that you face at the universities these days is the conflict between Christians and Muslim students at the university. And uh, I believe ethnic conflict is also another big issue in Nigeria. Uh, and I mean, in Ethiopian university, we do have also similar problems, religious conflict, uh, conflict uh, along ethnic lines in, the, in, in major universities. And, what do you think the role of higher education institutions should be in addressing these kind of problems as institutions are agents of social change in, in, in a society? Uh, and if there is anything that you are doing at the American University of Nigeria, uh, can you please share some of the things that you are doing currently? <clears throat> to address these uh, conflict issues among students in the, in the university? It, it, it comes down because it's, um, it's, it's about identity, um, religious identity. It's about um, students and faculty in, 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 in most cases as well, deriving their sense of self from their religious beliefs. And what we try to do with the SGA, the Student Government Association at AUN, is really to, to, to try to get students, even before those um, 
um, um, union elections, that they should see themselves beyond their religious beliefs, beyond their ethnic identities. They should create a multidimensional space around their faith, around their, their, their ethnic identities, and see who they are in addition to, to their faith, and see faith as, as faith, as, as beliefs in, in, in isolation of, of themselves. So that detachment, we really encourage that sense of detachment. Um, but this has not really been the case with other, with, with other universities. And um, the case of Modibo Adama University is, um, of technology is um, a very unfortunate case because I'm very familiar with that, um, with that university and students there. It's very unfortunate, but it's only one case um, in the midst of several, several others where the same identity politics, ethnic identity, but more increasingly so, religious identity politics. I mean, it's a whole in Nigeria, it's a, like I said, it's a hyper-religionized uh, uh, politics, really, in, in, in that country right now. Um, and um, the, the sense of, um, of religious identity is really, really strong. I mean, you're either a Christian or a Muslim, even before you say your name. So, um, and, and, and this, this is really stressing the political fabric, social fabric as well of the country, and it's extending, obviously, to, to universities. So, um, but there has to be a whole re-education, really, in sort of a recalibration of the way we look at identity. At, at religious beliefs. Yeah. Hello, I'm from Education International, which is a global federation of education unions, and I have a question regarding the guidelines on protecting education institutions from uh, from attacks. Since you, you mentioned it, I'm not sure whether Kenya and Nigeria have endorsed those guidelines, so you're saying they have. So how can universities and other education stakeholders be empowered to hold the governments accountable to actually respecting those guidelines? Do, do you want to take is that? that a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> I think since Gisela is really directly working directly under this, well, on this, I'm going to Nigeria next week. Ah, thank you so much for the question. Um, now I'm in the hot seat. Um, so it's, yeah, the Safe Schools Declaration, it's a political commitment. It's signed by states and championed by Argentina and Norway. And it gives effect to these guidelines for protecting schools and universities from military use, um, which basically say that um, state armed forces, also non-state armed actors, should never use schools for military purposes or universities. Uh, it's a practice that's depressingly common across uh, armed conflicts. Um, it also states that even when an educational building is out of use, they should be very restrained and only use it for the shortest amount of time necessary, make sure they don't damage it or they rehabilitate it before returning it to civilian use. And, they, and the guidelines also call for restraint when it comes to physical attacks on schools that have been occupied by your opposition. So in terms of scope, the guidelines are quite narrow, but they do, um, they do aim at reducing the military use of educational infrastructure and also encouraging actors to, encourage, to consider all feasible options before resorting to attack. Um, and of course, there's, there's an absolute prohibition on destroying uh, educational infrastructure in order to prevent it being used by your opposition. Uh, in terms of how, so yes, Nigeria and Kenya have both endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration. It's quite a new commitment. It's just three years old. Um, as I mentioned at the top, we have 74 states that have now endorsed. And interestingly, among those 74, are many of the most heavily affected by the issue. Um, so we have uh, Kenya, Nigeria, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Central African Republic, uh, countries for whom attacks on education is, is really a crucial issue. Um, the, the declaration provides a framework for action. It gives advice on a number of different practical steps that can be taken um, around protection, around continuing education, around alternative means of delivery. Um, it's 
it's not intended as a sort of a name and shame document, but it is a very useful advocacy tool. And so um, it, when the government has made that commitment and ha have taken the step of joining what we're calling now the safe schools community, um, they, they have made that commitment to, to take positive and tangible steps to improve. And then we hold them to account by having workshops, by having national workshops, regional workshops, international conferences where we invite the states together and really strongly encourage them to share positive examples of what they have done in order to fulfill their commitment. And as the number of uh, states that have endorsed is growing, we also have then some states in the donor community that can sometimes use it also as a tool in their discussions with authorities. So in terms of how the higher education um, sector could use it, I, I do believe that it is an advocacy tool and if we are to, if we are able to raise awareness of the existence of the declaration and the guidelines, the content of them, what the aims and objectives are and, uh, and who the stakeholders are that are interested in seeing them progress, then I do believe there's a huge amount of scope for uh, higher education practitioners to use this as a tool in their discussions. And that's where we have um, you know, the framework for action, which is available down there. Um, it goes through the commitments, what they are, what's intended to be achieved, whether states are fulfilling the commitment or not, and some examples of what states have done in the past. Um, so it's, it's really quite a concrete uh, tool in that sense. And then the guide to implementing the principles of state responsibility for protecting higher education, that's another tool that we've produced and I would encourage all of you to engage with it and, and also use it when you have discussions with authorities uh, on these matters. And then the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack is um, ready and willing and, and really keen to provide any type of advice or support that we can to university um, practitioners in, in helping them also with this work. I hope that answers your question. So it's, yeah, the, the, the movement is growing and we've just had Spain announce the next international conference which will be in Spain next year and we hope that we'll use that to push states to move forward so that they can come and share positive examples. Professor Warfa, did you want to respond? Yeah, I just, I just want to say one thing. In Kenya, we have police officers in all universities right now. You have to recruit police officers to make sure that there is security in every institution. Right now, Al-Shabaab is recruiting university students in Kenya. They're not only Muslims, but even non-Muslims. What they are doing. And these students are students who graduated from universities, students who are computer literate, students who are technicians, engineers, and everybody. And they're all moving to Somalia. That's now our problem. Students who are from the universities are coming back to destroy the universities again. This is the main problem in Kenya right now. We have quite a few more questions, actually. So here, and maybe, yeah, this gentleman here, and there's another gentleman to, to the back. Maybe we could take those three. I'm conscious that the time is up, so, but we can maybe take another couple of minutes. So uh, if you could be concise, and I know that's, the, you know, very ironic point for me, but <laughs> okay, so my question is for Nigeria. How do you maintain the scholar pool in Nigeria? What do I mean by that? I mean because in a neighboring country like Cameroon, when the government say that this guy is doing well in the university, he displaced the guy. So the government has the right to transfer a lecturer, a professor at any time. By doing that, he displays what he has been building in one university, he goes and get frustrated in another university and end up leaving the country. How do you manage that in Nigeria? Does Nigeria have self-independent for each university? Yeah, the short answer is any university, I mean, any professor can move from any university to another university if um, he or she so, so decides. By will, not by force. I mean, it's your choice. So, um, and every university is independent, even the government-owned universities. So they don't need the approval of, um, of the government to, to move, and they cannot be forced or transferred from one university to another um, 
yeah, without their consent. Yeah, uh, Gisela, another question on, on, the, on the statement. Um, uh, what does it actually imply when countries support it? And what is the story uh, why Germany and Switzerland are not supporting it? Yes, thank you for giving this opportunity to ask this question. I understand when I try to follow you very well that every country is doing something at national level. But my question is, what do you do at the African Union? How can you think to tackle these questions of the African level or at the regional level? For example, with ECOVAS, the CIGL, because the attack in, uh, in Nigeria, in Garissa, sorry for what happened, it didn't have all the attention that it deserved. And what happened in Congo, because I'm coming from Congo, we see, and you mentioned this, that all these terrorists are attacking. And now, for example, in Garissa, going in and try to recruit people, students, it can it can be Muslim or of Christian going inside is to recruit inside. This happened also in Congo. So what do you think at the African level? How can you tackle this at the African level or regional level? Thank you. Uh, just to give you an insight what happened earlier, why we were attacked is because Kenya was a safe haven for Al-Shawab leaders. They had Kismayu, which was a port they were using to, to, to export charcoal to the Arab world. And then Kenyan forces through UNISOB, through AMISOB, that's AMISOB, sorry, African forces, went into Kismayu and attacked them. That was their safe heaven. And it was now dispersed. And that's why they came to Kenya now to attack. But in the past, at least we were at peace with them. So right now we have so many forces in Somalia that are trying to stabilize the situation. There are forces from Sierra Leone, from Kenya, from Uganda, that are all over Somalia trying to make sure that Ethiopia also is included, from uh, African Union, they're trying to make sure that Somalia becomes a stable country. But still, you've been hearing a lot in the newspapers that even Mogadishu is not safe, because they're attacking Mogadishu. So despite all what happened, the African Union is trying their best to make sure that they stabilize Somalia. Once there's a stable government in Somalia, then we'll have peace in Kenya. Until that time, then we, there'll be no peace for us. Well, um, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. I, I, I do think that um, ECOWAS in West Africa can do a lot more. Um, the African Union can actually do, do a lot more. I mean, th there was a time, a um, lot of discourses um, a while ago about an African standby force. But th that, um, I mean, the, the, the problem with um, military or more kinetic interventions really is that they the military typically comes in, tries to solve a problem, but like we've seen in the case of Kenya and Somalia, they end up um, um, uh, 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 expanding the problem. So I really do think, I believe very much in community um, developed or community grown interventions where local communities work together to create their own local cultures of peace. That, I, I believe a lot more in communities working together rather than waiting for the regional or subnational organizations to intervene. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and thank you for the question on the Safe Schools Declaration. So Switzerland has signed. They were among one of the first countries to sign uh, in on May. The on the Swiss government's website? Or? It is, I think. 
Uh, we have a list of the endorsing states and Switzerland is, uh, is included because they were among the first group. Um, I'll double check just to make sure there's some, in case there's some anomaly. But, uh, and the official endorsement list is actually on the government uh, website of Norway because they are the depository of endorsements. It's a state-led process, of course, um, but strongly supported by, um, by the coalition, our members of UNICEF, UNESCO, UNHCR, Human Rights Watch, Save the Children, etc. Germany was a little bit of a different case. Um, they had some reluctance around the declaration uh, because it calls for um, making commitments that what go beyond what's required under international humanitarian law because there is no explicit prohibition in international humanitarian law of uh, military use of educational infrastructure. So, this was part of the, the reasoning. Um, I think that they, they felt as a, as a political declaration, it wasn't clear what the value of it would be, whether it would result in meaningful change. And so they took a cautious approach and they took a step back. Um, they didn't get involved in, in, in endorsing in the beginning. Uh, they are still, of course, a really important advocacy target from our perspective. So we are continuing our, our, our advocacy towards them and hope that they will join the fold sooner rather than later. We now have 22 members of the European Union, for example, and 32 members of the Council of Europe. So the pressure is mounting, I would say. Um, and then, of course, what helps us in our advocacy now is that we have had some very meaningful examples of implementation. So you asked, what happens when a state signs? Well, New Zealand has changed their, uh, dra their m manual for uh, the laws of armed conflict. Switzerland is in the process of doing the same, and they both now include explicit protections for education and uh, a call for restraint or avoidance of military use of educational infrastructure. Denmark has done the same. United Kingdom has issued a security doctrine note, um, which also calls for restraint with regard to military use. Uh, then more interestingly, perhaps in places like Sudan, there's been a directive issued so that the intelligence services stop using schools for military purposes, and they're in the process of evacuating some schools that have been used. Um, in Somalia, last year, we had the, one of the national universities was handed from AMISOM, the African Union peacekeeping force, back to the federal government. And they went through a whole process of rehabilitating the, the infrastructure, making sure that it was cleared of, of unexploded ordnance. And this was done explicitly within the framework of fulfilling their commitment under the declaration. Um, also in the Central African Republic, we had the MINUSCA peacekeeping force issue a directive prohibiting um, military use of schools, which is of course in line with the DPKO ban on military use, but reiterating that fact, um, drawing on the language of the guidelines, and they've used this as an advocacy tool to convince at least um, nine armed groups to vacate schools that they had been using for military purposes. So those are just some practical examples of how we see um, the impact on the ground. Um, at the risk of repeating myself, I'd know there are other examples in the framework for action if you're interested in, in reading further. Um, and then to mention as well about the African Union, in fact they have adopted the Safe Schools Declaration quite firmly as part of their programme of trying to uh, reduce military use and attacks on education um, through, by advocacy through advocacy by partners, they've included uh, the issue of attacks on education in their continental education strategy. Um, and the Peace and Security Council regularly has discussions around issues related to attacks on education um, linked also to other, and the military use of schools linked to other issues like child recruitment or, um, or also sexual exploitation and abuse or even early enforced marriage. These can all be linked to, to the use by armed actors of educational infrastructure. Um, so the Peace and Security Council and also the um, Oh, it's a long name. The Committee for Human Resources, Science and Technology has adopted a set of indicators uh, focused on reducing attacks on education and military use as well. So the work is really beginning, but I think there's um, 
good awareness and, and willingness also to, to proceed. And in Addis Ababa, they've just established a group of friends on children in armed conflict, which will include the Safe Schools Declaration as their, um, on their agenda. That's being led by Nigeria and Liberia, um, both of whom have endorsed the declaration. I'm conscious that we've really run over. I'm a really bad moderator, but um, I just want to thank again Dr. Dr. Jacob and Professor Warfa for really rich, interesting, moving, uh, inspiring contributions to this discussion and to wish you all the very best with your work as you continue. And uh, thank you to all of you for being here and for your really interesting questions and engagement.